Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be introducing uh, Professor Sir Keith Burnett, an outstanding scientist, academic mentor and colleague who has inspired myself and so many other scientists in the UK and beyond. He's the current president of the Institute of Physics, chair of the Nuffield Foundation, and also founding chair of the Academic Council of the Schmidt Science Fellows. He's an established advocate for international students and has made an impressive contribution both within the UK and globally on issues relating to science, innovation, the economy, and global cooperation assessing major societal challenges. Born in the Rhondda Valley, Wales, he attended Brintex School in Bridgend and went on to study physics, uh, both at undergraduate and postgraduate level at Jesus College in Oxford. He was a postdoc and then assistant professor at the University of uh, Colorado in Boulder, returning to the UK as a lecturer at Imperial College and then moving on to Oxford and a fellow of St. John's College. He has worked across many cutting edge topics, across atomic, molecular, optical physics and at the interface to condensed matter uh, physics. A notable mention I'd like to make close to my own heart is basically that he brought to the forefront, characterized and extended uh, a key equation for modeling ultra cold quantum matter that is used routinely to this day. Uh, he was chair of physics in Oxford, then head of mathematical, physical engineering and life science division before becoming vice chancellor at the University of Sheffield. He has served on a very large number of councils, including the Institute of Physics, the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, Science and Technology Facilities Council, and the Royal Society, the Prime Minister's Council for Science and Technology, and the Higher Educational Founding Council for England and Wales. He has received the Thomas Young Medal and Prize of the Institute of Physics in 1997. He was elected Fellow of the Royal Society in 2001 and Commander of the Order of British Empire in 2004 for his services to uh, physics and a knighthood in 2013 for services to science and higher education. And he's a long-standing advocate for high-quality vocational education and technician training and has served as the president of the Science Council and various other roles. So without further ado, it's a pleasure to welcome Sir Keith Burnett. Well, thank you, Nick. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you this evening. It's going to be a rather personal and mostly pictorial presentation, I should say. Uh, but I want to tell you about why I, as an individual, care so much about the international dimension of science, why it's so important to me, and why it's important, I think, to all of us in this room. So I'm going to go back and forward, but let's go forward to a remark, first of all, that was made. At the end of the Second World War, Vannevar Bush was the leader of many aspects of the American science establishment. He's working with James Conant to establish a science of the future that would make the United States powerful in the long term. And he wrote a book and a report called The Endless Frontier. And since that time, of course, the United States has been, in many ways, the dominant scientific power in the world. There was a re retreat, a new uh, US National Academy of Sciences Endless Frontier Symposium. And the first remark made by one of the Nobel laureates in that about the United States was, we're a small country. And what she was saying was that any country fact, that thinks it can draw even as large and powerful as the United States, has all of the intellectual power, all of the ideas and the capabilities to exist in this powerful future world that evolves. You could say, us, we're not as large as the United States, we're not as powerful technologically, and I would say we're even more reliant on the flow of individuals and capable people from abroad. And basically that's the theme I'm going to develop. I'm going to tell you why I feel it and to tell you some story of my life and why I have experienced it, and that's going to be my theme. So, let's go back. This is Keith. Now, I know it's a bit scary. Um, <laughs> you saw the picture without the beard. This is one without the beard again. This is me in the University of Colorado, starting to be a teacher, um, 1979, 1980. And what I want to go back to is how did I end up as a scientist? You know, what is it that led me? Why did I have you? my first real job as a scientist. And it is actually 
Heine Kuhn. So Heine Kuhn was actually a physicist at Göttingen. Uh, he was with James Frank. If you know the history of quantum mechanics and you heard of the Frank Hertz experiment, the critical thing, James Frank was his mentor. And he studied, and, but he had to leave Germany in 1933. We know, many of us know what happened in 1933, the extraordinary changes in Nazi Germany and the fact he had to leave. He came because at that stage, a uh, New Zealander, Rutherford started to understand how important it was to develop safety for gifted scientists from Germany at that time. And they started together, and I'll come back to this, you know, a campaign for supporting and keeping vulnerable academics, vulnerable people who needed them. And he came then as the first uh, refugee scholar to Balliol. And don't worry, you're going to be in this, Newcastle's going to be in this story as well, I'm going to come to it. He came there. But he started the atomic physics group that I joined, right? He is my scientific grandfather. Here he is in Göttingen. Now, this is a challenge. You have to spot all those people who ever went to see the film Oppenheimer. Did everybody see the film? Yeah, there you are. Now, you have to spot in this picture Oppenheimer. Uh, you have to have James Frank, Heine. OK, we'll get, we're going to get it afterwards. And then also. Oppenheimer went to study under Max Born at Göttingen as well. Right? This is the group that did it. It's a wonderful, extraordinarily vibrant uh, group. And if you saw the film, uh, you also saw within that that, do you remember the part when uh, Oppenheimer said, we're going to beat the Germans because of anti-Semitism at that point? We're going to be open to the possibilities of having gifted scientists come to us. That's going to be our strength. And Oppenheimer saw it, and it was critical to that. He did that. Interestingly, you could ask, what did Heine do when he came to the United Kingdom with this scheme? Well, for a while, he was working on atomic spectra, and then he worked on the Tube Allies project. In other words, the part, the British part of the atomic bomb project. What's interesting, I was talking to an old mate who's done the history of the Clarendon Lab. This is a laboratory that I was brought up in. And during the war, was working on two very important secret things. One was radar, <laughs> and the other was the atomic bomb, separating uranium from the bomb. Um, the emigres were not allowed to work on the really secret work at the time, which was, of course, radar. They were allowed to work on the atomic bomb, of course, because <laughs> that, was, that was clearly some wild thing that would never work. So then. What happened to Heine? Well, he came and he worked. And I want to tell you about one person to link back to Newcastle. So, of course, Heine taught a, a group of people, including my supervisor. He's my scientific grandfather. But also one of his really brilliant students was Russell Heinmarsh. Now, some of you may not know of Russell Heinmarsh, but Russell Heinmarsh actually started atomic physics at Newcastle. He was one of the youngest professors at the time. He was 31 when he came here. And in fact, then, if you'd come here, as I did many years ago, you'd have seen the other students of Heine. Uh, not him, also him, but uh, you may know Edwin Lewis. You may know Bill King, people who were here. They started up a very, very important the United Kingdom's capability in atomic physics and flourishes in various ways still to this day. So and that's the first thing I want to point out. Somebody who was saved <laughs> came to the country not only developed the idea of the atomic bomb in Oxford, but also trained a whole generation across the United Kingdom, in fact, not just at Newcastle, at Oxford, at Sussex, across this United Kingdom. It was a powerful gain to the United Kingdom. And then, so I had that benefit. I was actually part of the group at Oxford that was trained. And I started then, my first year then, as a uh, first year postgraduate student. And I went to the next example of international things that drove my career. I went to the Maison Française in Oxford. The Maison Française actually brings people from the French culture to, to Oxford. And there was at that meeting Claude Contenugi. Now, Simon and I know him very well. Claude won the Nobel Prize in 97 for his work. But he gave a lecture in English, actually. I did read his other stuff in French which convinced me about the importance of new area of lasers. 
They were in the night, this is 1975. The first bright laser sources were being developed that were useful in the laboratory. Till that time, most of the people doing experiments on atoms had to use lamps and discharge tubes. Suddenly, there was this available, this bright, intense thing called a laser. Everyone probably got one at home now. And actually, I can use one here. If I, if I click this, you can see the little wimpy laser. But actually, that stage, it was very exciting. So I learned, first of all, from, from Claude, some very exciting physics which launched me on my career. And in fact, worked with him indirectly over the years. But again, it showed me that if I was going to be a successful scientist, I was not going to be able to just listen to the people locally in Oxford. <laughs> or in the United Kingdom. I was going to have to look across to other places and understand them. The other person who influenced me then in terms of that development is a guy called Avraham Ben Raven from Tel Aviv University. I saw as a scientist that the way I would be do the most interesting science, do the best thing, was to be open to ideas from other places. And that's what I did through my career. So we've got one of my students here. Actually, there he is. You saw him, Professor Prokakis, there on the left. Um, when I came back to Oxford and you heard about it, I had the most extraordinary benefit of having a flow of clever, brilliant international students from Greece, from New Zealand, from all around the world, in fact, who actually fed into the capability of my group and the science of the United Kingdom. So on the left, we have Nick. Nick at the time was actually working on what was the brand new, exciting area of making very, very cold things. It was a wonderful time, wasn't it, Nick? And then the right here, you see my other student, joined with Peter Knight, actually, Imperial College, Arthur Eckert. Now, you may have heard of quantum technologies, right? You may have heard the Prime Minister say, we're going to deliver quantum for the United Kingdom or things of that sort. So who is it that actually related the quantum possibilities, this quantum science to ideas of technology. Who was it? Well, one of the pivotal figures in that was this guy, Arto Eckert. And where was he from? Poland. He was a Stefan Batory student, funded by Soros, actually, coming to, the, and just recently, this year, he won a prize from the Royal Society as one of the people who developed the ideas of quantum. I put them here because I want to show you that, that without the capability of people from diverse cultures, and can, this country would not have the scientific capability. It would not have the quantum technology that we're much vaunted in going to do, right? I'm going to carry on this theme, but I hope you're starting to get the idea of why I would be so convinced about the importance of international links. I hope you're seeing that they are really critical to it. I'm going to say as well, which I really saw to, that I did mention the, the family relationship, didn't I? I said I was the grandson of, great-grandson of James Frank. Well, of course, you then are my scientific son. Do you have any of my grandchildren in this audience? <laughs> <laughs> are there any of Nick's students in the audience? Well, I think there, there's one of my grandchildren, and there's another one at the back. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So I, I then... So that was my most wonderful scientific career at Oxford. And then, in, um, Nick told you, then uh, later in my career, I, I went to the University of Sheffield. And I was very, very lucky to go to the University of Sheffield because I um, come from a mining valley in South Wales. Right? My background is actually in an industrial community with the importance of understanding, just as Nick said, of vocational education and skills of that sort. And it was wonderful to be at the University of, of Sheffield to see that local manufacturing and skills of that sort. But again, I came across an absolutely wonderful example of somebody with skills that we needed. <laughs> you may not know that the University of Sheffield, OK, there's steel, there's manufacturing, things of that sort, is an absolutely amazing center for plant sciences. Most extraordinary place for plant sciences, the University of Sheffield. Um, if you're there and you happen to go to the car park in front of the Arts Tower, underneath this uh, car park, there's a most incredible complex of places where they can grow plants under all conditions around the world. Uh, conditions back in time. Well, how did plants grow 50 million years ago? And then, this is another person who came from Cara. You know that same program that brought Heine Kuhn? This is, there he is, there's Moed. 
He came again on a Vulnerable Scholars program. What did he know? Well, I hope you can see on the right there, he knew plants. <laughs> and I saw then, and when we, we sat down, didn't we, Ruth, sat down with Moed and, and talked about the problems of where he'd come from, a Syrian refugee camp. Again, very common in the world now for scientists actually to find themselves in vulnerable situations. It's not uncommon. We've seen all of the un destruction of universities in Gaza. We've seen destruction in Ukraine. We've seen destruction of environments. He was one of a great big refugee camp in Syria, coming to Sheffield. And what he did then, this is the refugee camp he went back to work. 82,000 people, displaced people. And he developed then, with the, the, his skills, a hyper, hydroponic system for this camp. Not only that, I mean, you know that. And actually, not only that, Tony Ryan, you probably know the work he did. This is just part of it, actually being to recycle bicycles, <laughs> make, make all sorts of mattresses, all sorts of things, right? Our colleague here knows it. But actually, this, this is an example of somebody who came on a vulnerable scholar basis, came and took knowledge that he had at the University of Sheffield and then brought it back to this refugee camp. It was funded partly, again, by CARA, and also funded, I should say, by Jeremy Grantham, great philanthropist who decided that he should fund parts of it. But if you see that, if you see what a, a gifted person can do if they're supported and have the idea, it is absolutely wonderful to see it. So I, won't, I don't have time to go on to that, but I do want to mention one thing at the side, which is at the, at the University of Sheffield, this university, you'll also see many other cultures and many other nations. If you go into the streets of Newcastle, you'll see many evidences of the vibrant Chinese population there is in this university. You'll see other cultures well across the world. Those people are absolutely fundamental now to the function of British universities. They're not just adding cultural diversity. They bring in the most extraordinary power intellectually. They bring in the most incredible amount of income to this university as well. And it's fundamental, the operation of it. So when you see all those vibrant people, just, just be very grateful that they're driving this great big hub of learning. So I had a great time at Sheffield. And then I went on. I, re I retired. Isn't that a lovely word? <laughs> 65. Took my pension. And then somebody said, in fact, it was the ex-vice chancellor of Oxford said, um, you should get Keith to look after this new generation of international scientists. And this is, a, this is Eric and Wendy Schmidt. Now, Eric Schmidt, you probably heard of. Eric Schmidt was the chief executive and chair of Google. And when he stepped down, he made a foundation called Schmidt Futures, which is aimed to driving scientific discovery that will benefit humanity. And one of the things he decided to do was, and this is with the help of a guy called Stu Feldman, wouldn't it be wonderful if scientists had the opportunity to work on problems of great importance to the world? Can we identify the clever people from around the world that want to do that? Can we let them have an exciting vision? Can we support them in that transition where, where they want to go and what they want to do? And can they address the things? And I was given then the opportunity to help these young people, not in their selection, actually. Once they were selected from across the world, there's about 500 apply each year. We select about 30 of them. I was then their mentor to help them choose where to go and what to do and what problems to solve. So you imagine, this is one of the most exciting jobs I've ever done, right? I get to talk to the most interesting, fascinating people from around the world. What do they want to do? Why do they want to do it? How will it have an impact on the world? So I'll give you a little example of the sort of people we have. This is from the first cohort. Now, you, Simon, will recognize Steve Chu here, Nobel laureate. <laughs> um, in fact, that with, with Claude Contenucci, right? Steve is there. This is at Stanford. And around him are our Schmidt fellows. So this is Shi Wen Gung. She started her career in Shanghai. She's now at the University of Michigan. She was a material scientist working actually principally on some beautiful little quantum dots, but she has developed a program for wearable devices for medicine. So you can actually you can have the electronic devices, but you can wear them, hats, patches, things like that, and they give you diagnostics of the problems you have and the issues you develop. She's working in Michigan. Here is 
Zhang Jielai. She was an astrophysicist, but she realized that the things that she knew about how to look at transient phenomena, things changing quickly, could be used to image fetuses. <laughs> and so this was her work here. This is Wes. He's now working on the moon base. He's actually working at APL on moon base problems. But this gives you an idea of the sort of range of problems. But wh where are they from? United States, China, Australia, uh, you know, everywhere. And this is one of my favorites. This is Jyoti Mandal. So Jyoti grew up in Bangladesh. He did, uh, as it says, a PhD at Columbia and then worked at UCLA. What is he working on? Well, Jyoti understands. He comes from a place that's pretty warm. And he knows that one of the greatest problems you're going to have in things is heat, heat load, especially in an urban environment or things of that sort. You can use, as is happening in India at the moment, astonishing amount of work on, on buying uh, cooling devices. Right? Air conditioning now is one of the most common and brutal causes in, of, of needing energy. And in fact, building coal power stations in India. Right? Enormous growth in building coal power stations to drive the air conditioners and things like that. This is total disaster. So Jyoti says, can we have uh, passive devices? You know? So it's texture, basically types of paint and coverings. Is it possible to design things of that sort? So he moved then from what he was really as a physicist, an optical physicist, into this domain. He's now a, he's now a professor at Princeton uh, and is working on those things. He's already developed new types of, actually, some metamaterial, some patterned materials, some paints. And what's great about Jyoti is he comes from a background where he knows that the technology will have to be simple. You will not have to pay vast amounts for a new machine or a new process. You must have it so it's possible to do it. He's absolutely brilliant. He can go into Costco, buy a bunch of stuff like some paint and things like that, and then get it moving into things that are important for cooling a building. It's absolutely brilliant. So again, what I'm saying is that these problems that we have are, are only soluble if we join together across the capabilities that we have. And I'm going to mention two of them because I'm getting close to, to winding up on my talk. But I want to mention two of them because they're so relevant and you may have heard them talk about it. The first is um, what the Institute of Physics is working on. Um, last week we had an important report on how do physics technologies impinge on the green economy. You know, so all of us are looking at how we will have a lower carbon burden, how we will do things. And that's so important to all of us. We all know about it. But actually, the technologies we need to do it, some of them are here. Some of them are actually policy decisions. But some of them, and the things I've been involved in, are still exciting to go forward. One of them, for example, is fusion power. Fusion power is the ability to make, this is a picture of it, to make a device which has a small version of the sun inside it. A sole version of the sun that makes energy, makes power. The most advanced one of those is actually at Cullum. That's been the most advanced example of the, it's called a tokamak. Um, you may or may not know that actually the, the moment we're planning to build, the UK is planning to build a set of small scale tokamaks across the United Kingdom with a plan to actually make them Produce power by about 2040. Um, how did that technology get developed? How is it possible they were able to do that? The place where the idea is what's called the Joint European Taurus. <laughs> the ideas were developed because people across Europe and the world got together to design a capability of new fusion power. It would not be happening if it hadn't been that all those smart people got together in Oxfordshire. All those great scientists came from across the world and worked it, and now have some absolutely plausible ways to move forward on it. That's one thing. The other thing everyone would talk about is artificial intelligence and its impact on our world. We at the, I'm talking now about the scientists here, and particularly those in Royal Society, have been how, saying, how do we develop AI for the benefit of society? If you look at it, it is impossible to conceive of this being done on a purely national basis. 
It's impossible to think that we will somehow say the United Kingdom can define all of the things to do with artificial intelligence, all the regulation, all the nature of construction, all the protocols associated with use. It has to be done as an international enterprise. It has to be done as something that joins together. And you may say, well, maybe there are bad people. You know, maybe there are people who are trying to misuse that. Well, of course there are. But the only way in which you're going to do good is, is to get together with others. And let me tell you, when you get together with, as we have with the Nuffield Foundation, when you've got together with AI specialists from the People's Republic of China, <laughs> and you may say, oh my God, you're getting together with people in the public. Are you looking at the misuse of AI and the difficult things? No, we're trying to think what we have in common. And what you'll be, would you love to see if you saw a bunch of British computer scientists, AI ethicists getting together with Chinese, what you'd find is an astonishing number of common problems on how we protect our nature and our policy. I know that may sound strange. You may think you've heard all things about the conspiratorial things, the danger of China, things of that sort. But in terms of individuals, people, scientists, there's far more we share in common than we do as difference. And let's remember, you know, the problems, the big scale problems we've got are all international. It's either wildfires across many parts of the world, whether it's from California or whether it's in, in Australia. It's drought in various places now in, in Africa. Or it's storms and atmospheric rivers at the moment in, in, in California. You know, the, all these issues are global ones. None of them respect national boundaries. None of them have got to do with our perceptions of ourselves, our flags, our places we stand, or anything of that sort. They're all global, and we will work together with them. And we do have to remember that we're still an incredibly unequal world. I mean, people talk at the moment about the cost of living crisis in the United Kingdom. True, there are many families finding it extraordinarily difficult to make ends meet at the moment. But we're still comparatively an extraordinarily rich society compared to others. And we have to bear that in mind when we see the differences, whether it's in healthcare, capability, access to information, and access to energy. Just an aside, so you could say decarbonization, you know, isn't it good we'll go for a net zero economy? You know? Yes. What's the biggest challenge to going to net zero in the world at the moment? You know, what is the most difficult thing about it? Is it us, is it the United Kingdom? No. Uh, we're very rapidly putting on renewable power. We're building new wind and things of that sort. We're going very rapidly. What's the real problem in the world? People who can't afford to do it. There are many places who are building large capabilities in coal power because it's cheap. And they need it for their developing economy. So if we don't perceive that, if we think it's just to do with us, to our things, we will not solve the problems. We're in, an, it, we're in a world that needs our understanding, a world that will need our understanding of the problems countries have that are building new coal stations of that sort. And yet we're actually at this time of astonishing scientific discovery at the same time. These inequalities and the difficulties. Um, I'm doing a picture here of, of the Large Hadron Collider because I want to make a contrast with our capability and our goals. And I want to start to wrap up because I want to come back to why I think this is important and why I think there are great dangers if we don't acknowledge the need to be truly international. And so this goes to the borders of science. This is a report by the Royal Society. I talked about Science Sans Frontières. This is the borders of science. What is happening in the moment in the world that actually quench our ability to solve the problems? You sort of know them, but let me just go through them just to remind us of it. Nationalism, growing nationalism. It's inevitable, I mean, it's inevitable that in, in times of difficulty, financial difficulty, that nationalism grows. It's, you know, it, it's not difficult to understand why people are more concerned about their jobs, more concerned about their housing, more concerned about their environment. That's not issue. Um, but we must hang on to the idea that we must share ideas and we must have mobility for the clever people do things. Whereas what's happening, the tensions, is that we're fearing that we should share. We're shutting down much of the mobility that we need. We're shutting down parts of the sharing. These are restrictions of cost. There was an article in the Financial Times at the moment. And now the cost, for example, for a five-year visa 
for family coming is 20,000. Heard about 20,000 plus the NHS things. This is vastly more than any other country in the world, remember. <laughs> it's a great danger to the United Kingdom that we don't see that sharing ideas, I'll talk about, is powerful, is good for us. And also, what we're doing is we're looking at withdrawing from international partnerships. Again, look, I, don't get me wrong, I understand many, why many people wanted to go for Brexit. It's not a problem. But please, let's understand that our ability to share science, ideas, and capability isn't still needed and still must be done. So I think what I'm going to ask all of you to do, in a sense, is having listened to my lecture, being utterly convinced by it, will go out and convince all your friends and family, right? Yeah, no, I'm see you're going to do that. And let's just, just round up. This is a lovely picture, really, of, of Steve Toop with the head of Tsinghua University. Because this is the deal, right? No single country, you know, no single institution. Even a great place like this, no single country. Even the biggest has the capacity to do all the work that's necessary to advance really complicated issues like climate change, infectious disease, etc. You have to collaborate to do it. And our universities, this university, is a wonderful example of international collaboration. Right? What I've seen just my visit this afternoon is extraordinarily gifted scientists from across the world who've come to Newcastle to work on these problems, right? So we do, we have done that. We have actually gathered the great, let's not choke that off. Let's keep us to the places that are able to attract in that way. And then I come back to the final thing, which is the motto of my school. And I have to tell you about it, because I'm from South Wales, remember? And uh, in the Mabinogion, there's a story, it's one of those clearly believable stories of a giant um, helping the Welsh invade Ireland. You mean, you know, the idea is, you know, that the, the Welsh are the Irish who can't swim. You know that, don't you? And the, uh, but anyway, helps to invade Ireland. And one place, they come to the River Shannon, and um, uh, the leader actually lays himself down, and his men walk across the river. That's the idea. And in it, it says, I've all been bit bond. He would be a leader, be a bridge. And I think that's, that's the motto, that the strength comes not from the barrier and the walls that we build around it. It comes from the links. It comes from the bridges between cultures. It keeps that sort. And I'd like to thank you for your attention and invite questions from the audience.